I'm Phil Zeidman. I practice law in Washington with the international law firm of DLA Piper. Delighted to be here and my gratitude to the organizers of this program and conference, which is to the best of my knowledge, the first time a law school has devoted an entire day to the subject of franchising. And I share Robert Emerson's feeling that that is long overdue. If you want to know about the history of franchising, you can do, as Robert said, and go back and take a look at some very interesting old books. There are some very badly written and in inaccurate articles on the subject. You could read those. Uh, there are people who will tell you endlessly that the first franchise in the world was the Singer Sewing Machine Company. I was amused by Robert's first slide with the map of the empire of Charlemagne because I once sat through an interminable session in Paris in which members of the French Franchise Federation sought to persuade a group of visiting American franchisors, equal mixture of boredom and skepticism, to try to persuade them that the first franchisor was really Charlemagne. My view is pretty simple, that mo modern franchising, what we view as franchising today, is essentially the product of post-World War II America. If you try to roll back the clock to that point in time, you'll see several interesting social movements taking place simultaneously. First, in America, there was the release of long pent-up demand. People who had not been able to buy during World War II certainly had the end of gas rationing. Products which were in short supply like sugar suddenly became available. Cars were being manufactured. People were discovering, rediscovering leisure time. And they wanted to get in their new cars and drive down their new highways to new restaurants and new hotels and stay places with their kids. And so you had that at the same time that there was a return to the states of a very large group of World War II veterans. And they revived the post World War I song, How Do You Keep Them Down on the Farm After They've Seen Paris? And that was, in fact, what they discovered, that these veterans, empowered by their combat experiences, a little mustering out pay in their pockets, and with the visions first glimpsed of a world beyond what they had imagined possible, did not want to go back and work in the farms and factories of their fathers and grandfathers and they came back determined to do something else. And just about that time, something interesting was happening which can't really be explained very easily, a simultaneous development of, of activity in different parts of the country. Just a few examples. A man in Illinois who sold milkshake machines was struck by the fact that one little restaurant in, in California was buying a, an inordinate number of his milkshake machines. So interested to see what it was, he came out to California and visited this restaurant and found that crowds were around the block, not just for his milkshakes, but for hamburgers and french fries. And he went to the two brothers who owned this restaurant and he negotiated a deal to buy their name and to take it himself and spread it. And thus, the McDonald brothers' name got spread around the world. At the same time, there was a man in Kansas City who was struck by the fact that with the advent of the modern income tax reaching a much larger number of the population, but with people having some interest in their leisure time and not wanting to become involved in all these forms, that he could set up a system of having people come in and help you do your tax returns. And he could do it on a seasonal basis, and he could rent inexpensive lofts and shopping centers where you could do it from. So he took the last letter of his name, H, changed it to a more Americanized version of K, and, this, and thus did Henry and Richard Block form H&R Block. At the same time, there was a man in Memphis, Tennessee, who was a home builder. And he took his wife and his four kids, and he got in his car, and he drove up the east coast of the United States. And they stopped in little motels each night. And by the end of that trip, he was very irritated because he had discovered that he never knew when he got to the hotel whether it was going to be have a swimming pool or not. Did it have the number of towels he needed? And most, most irritating to him was that when he had a pleasant evening, pleasant stay, 
he couldn't then go and know where he was going to stay the next night because there was no way of making a reservation for the next night's stay. And he said to his wife, he said, I think I get a group of my home builder friends and just take it, the kind of box we build. We'll make it bigger, make it a motel. And uh, I think, you know, I think we could do this. She told me many years later that at that moment there was a, a movie playing with Bing Crosby called Holiday Inn. So that's what he decided to name it. And she told me also, he said to her, he said, you know, I think someday we could have 400 of these. And finally, about the same time, there was a man in Kentucky who got reached the age of 65 and had nothing except his Social Security. But he knew how to cook. And he got in his car, and he drove from restaurant to restaurant, and he knocked on the door, and he's holding a skillet in his hand. And he said, let me come in and fry your chicken. And they said, well, how are we going to work out the economics of this? He said, oh, very simple. He said, if you like it, I'll charge you the elegant, the elegant phrase that the financial arrangement reached was, I'll charge you a nickel a head. And that was Colonel Sanders. And that was all happening within a very, very short time. And those, the coalescence of those social movements, in my view, is really the explanation of the birth of modern franchising. Now, what does that mean? I move this by going here. Yeah. What is what is the purpose? What is the what is the, what makes franchising different than other forms of distribution? I have a product or service that I want to sell. I'm the seller of goods or services. Robert is my target customer. And what I want to do is I want to sell the maximum number of products at the right price point to get the maximum return on my investment by my selling to Robert. So in most of the history of the world, there were two ways I could do this. I could go to Brian, and I could hire Brian as my employee. And he comes to work when I tell him to come to work, and he works the days I tell him he works, and he wears the uniform I tell him he wears, and he advertises it the way I tell him to, and it's sold at the prices which I've set, and it's totally and utterly controllable. The problem is it's also a very slow way to grow because I'm paying the rent or buying the building. I'm buying the goods and don't get anything back until after Brian has sold them to somebody. I'm paying the rent, the utilities, electricity, et cetera. So to get from one unit to two units, not to speak of 200 or 2,000, is a very slow process. So the other way I could do it is, if you look on the right side of the screen, what is your name? Mary Beth, I could go to Mary Beth, who's already in this business. I'm still trying to reach Robert. But I could go to Mary Beth and I'd say, Mary Beth, I really like your store. I might have done a little bit differently, but it's a nice place. I'd like for you to take on my line and add them to what you've already got there. So that when people come to shop from you, they'll also be able to buy my products or services when they go to you. Now that way is terrific as far as speed of growth because I'm not, I'm getting paid by Mary Beth before she even resells the goods. I'm not paying the rent or buying the building. She's doing that. She has all, bears all the burden and, very, and a very substantial part of the risk and I can move on to operation number two or 200 or 2000 with considerable speed. But the converse of the first example, it's not very controllable. If Mary Beth decides she wants to change things, if Mary Beth decides she wants to go play golf, if she decides she wants to close down for the season and go live somewhere else for a while, I'm stuck. People are not buying my goods and services because there's no place to do it. Now, I can go in and terminate my relationship with her, and then I've got to scrounge around and try to find a substitute. So what we have here is two examples which are polar opposites. One controllable, but no speed of growth. One great speed of growth, but not controllable. 
And that really, at its heart, is the explanation of the middle course, which is franchising. Because with franchising, I can combine the best of both and try to ameliorate, at least, the disadvantages of both. I can have a person like Mary Beth, who is an entrepreneur at heart that I seek out, not Brian, a drudgery-filled employee. I can go to Mary Beth and say, you're the kind of person I'm looking for. But the contract I'm going to have with Mary Beth is going to be awfully close to the one I had with Brian as an employee. It can't be completely. The law won't let me do it completely that way. But I'm going to try to get pretty close to it, to be honest with you, to try to control what Mary Beth does as close to the way I can control what Brian does as possible. And that's really what started to be called a franchise. Robert's perfectly right. It comes from these ancient terms of the grant of a right, but it has very little to do with Charlemagne in today's world. So what makes what I've just described to you a franchise? The, we'll talk about the United States at first only. There are different laws at the federal level and at the state level, and we'll talk about all of those. At the state level, there are different kinds of laws. We'll talk about those. And to some degree, the, de the, the definitions are different in all places. But the truth is, is that there is a, on a bell curve, uh, the bell, the top, would be the following three elements of what makes it a franchise. Now, I'm taking these from the Federal Trade Commission rule. But the fact is, one way or another, you will find them in one form or another in virtually every regulation of franchising. And those, I put those in quotes because they're all misleading. They're not entirely what they say that they are, but people use those terms as a shorthand for what they are. The first, the first of those is the so-called trademark element. What that says is that I grant now we're using Mary Beth as our franchisee. I grant Mary Beth the right to use my trademark, which only I own and which can't be used without my grant to her. And I grant with her not just the bare naked license of the mark, but I give her the right to operate a business identified or associated with my trademark or to offer or sell goods associated with it. Now, over the years, you will find that this has been expanded, and it's not just my mark. It's other intellectual property um, evidence, uh, so that there have even been cases holding that when Pizza Hut granted somebody, the, that, that when somebody put up an operation with the Pizza Hut roof, that was a part of what Pizza Hut's intellectual property was. So that one way or another, though, I've given Mary Beth the right without which she could not use it. So that's element number one. And remember, these are all connected with ands, not ors. So all three of these must be present, except in New York where only two must be present. The, um, the next element, again misleading, but called control or assistance. And in some states it's called uh, marketing plan. In some states it's called places it's called community of interest. But one way or another, it consists of these elements. It says, not only have I given Mary Beth the right to use this mark and operate a business, but she's not going to be on her own, either, as she might wish, to be on her own in terms of how she operates, or is she going to be on her own in terms of help? So that what the Federal Trade Commission rule says is that the second element has either of two parts. Either I exert or have authority to exert a significant degree over Mary Beth's method of operations. So I can tell her what time to open. I can tell her what days to operate, things that I couldn't normally do if I were just granting a mark. I go beyond that and do that. Or, in most cases, it's actually and, but in most cases, the, the other is, or I provide her a significant assistance in her method of operations. Whereas before I came along, she was selling goods and services, goods which she bought from other people and then sold on her own. And she could do it pretty much the, the way she wanted, but she also didn't get much help from them. I'm going to give her a lot. I'm going to help her get started. I'm going to give her training. I'm going to give continuing R&D and the like. So it's, it's either one or the other, although, as I say, most franchisors do both. Now, if 
if you left it at that, you say that's fine, but where's, where's the money involved in this? And that's where you come to the next and final element. And that's what is loosely called the fee element. All that really means is, is that as a condition of this relationship, Mary Beth has to pay me some money. She's obligated to do so, either by contract or by the way the business normally works. She's committed to make a required payment to me. Now, if you stopped at that point, you'd say, that's every single business in America because everybody in business is paying somebody for something, for the right to do something with that, resell or otherwise. So there have been many, many uh, further emendation, emendations of this. The principal one of which is to say it's not just any money. If all Mary Beth did was to, the only, if the only money she paid me was to purchase goods from me for resale, which is after all what most businesses do, if that's the only money that flows from her to me, and if it's a unless it's a reasonable quantity of goods she's buying for me for resale, if all she's doing that and is doing that and is doing that at a bona fide wholesale price, then it doesn't qualify as a fee. But there are lots of holes in that. For example, it's a John Deere tractor store. She buys 12 tractors for resale. I say you gotta buy a 13th one to put as a display out. Well, she's just bought something for me that wasn't just for resale. There's a training fee. Well, that's something that's not just products for resale. The money she pays for me for my products, even though they're for resale, I add a little bit more on than just the normal markup. That's a hidden franchise fee. So it's not a reasonable, but it's not a bona fide wholesale price. So there's lots and lots of ways in which what looks like a standard distribution arrangement can actually be categorized as a franchise. And that, at its heart, is what we call a franchise today. Now, I want to go back to the, I want to go back to, yeah, I think, how do I get to these? How do I move to, the, to this? How do I move, Robert, how do I move to where we were before we put these three on, my original ones? Do you know how we get back to this? Oh, to get back to that? To this one, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There we go. No, we're all set. We're all set. That's it. That's it. Okay. So now we go what was going to be the rest, what was going to be the beginning before the, before the, uh, before the foreplay. So we're going to talk now about an extension of this discussion which we'll get to the subject of international franchising and we'll get to the subject of the regulation of franchising. Well, we're gonna start with the United States. Why and what do we know? Well, we start because that's where franchising started. That the heart of franchising was the United States and despite, as you will see, the enormous growth of indigenous franchises around the world, it remains the place. And what we know about franchising is that it is a tremendous force in the economy. That there are 800,000 businesses in the United States which are franchised. That it's something like uh, $8 billion in terms of the amount that, uh, that, yeah, that the number of people employed is extraordinary. But the more important, that if you expand that, to the companies that provide the goods and services to franchise companies, it's $2.1 trillion. So it is a portion of the economy which far exceeds what people think of frequently as the heart and guts of the American economy. It is ubiquitous, you see it everywhere you go, but it also adds up to very, very big dollars. And that's why we start here to explain what franchising is and wh where it's gone. Why is it this way? What is it about franchising that's caused people to gravitate toward it? From the franchisor's point of view, if you go back to my example, this is a way in which I can spread the distribution of my goods and services 
in a far more efficient, cost efficient and, and managerial efficient way than I could ever do if I had to rely entirely upon my own human and financial resources. I couldn't possibly do it. I can control it. I can spread this to produce a consumer awareness. I can find people who have an adrenaline, like Mary Beth, that far exceeds what Brian has, the employee. And I can, because, because the, the, these are people who want to make a, a, a life for themselves, and this is a way for them to do it. And the truth is, is that every study that's been shown, been done, shows that the likelihood is that the franchise operated business is going to be more efficient, more effective, than the, than the ones that are run by my own employees because these are people who have more to gain than does somebody who simply clocks out at the end of the day. So I am able to uh, spread this growth in a way that reduces the burden on me because I have put much of this in the hands of the person whose real interests are at stake here. And therefore, it is a very effective way for me to spread my goods and services around the world. From Mary Beth's point of view, it's a way for her to get to be able to operate much more effectively than if she were able if she was simply operating Mary Beth's. She has the training that I'm going to give her that she wouldn't otherwise have. She's going to have a flow of products and services that she couldn't afford to keep bringing in. She's going to have ad, be a part of an advertising program that she couldn't possibly afford if she were a single unit operator. So that she's operating a system which has been proven of which she's become part of. Now let's make no mistake. They're not just pluses, they're minuses. From my point of view, the fact is I can't control it as completely as I could have controlled Brian. There are, there are degrees in which she is, Mary Beth is beyond my control. And from a financial point of view, I will bring less money in than if I owned that store myself. Because all I'm getting in the case of Mary Beth is a percentage, maybe 5%, of what she sells it at retail. So I clearly, if we were looking purely at gross, I would do better financially with my own stores. But of course, from a return on investment point of view, the picture is very different because the, the I in ROI in a franchise arrangement is much less. My investment in the case of Mary Beth is far less than my investment in the store of my own that I had to put up. So my ROI is much higher. But nonetheless, it, it brings in less for some considerable period of time than a company owned operation. But weighing those pluses and minuses over the years, tremendously increasing number of people have concluded that franchising is a way for them to achieve their objectives, both at the franchisor level and at the franchisee level. Now, we've had a number of people who've come in since we began, and so I should tell you the ground rules are that we're going to have a panel later, take Q&A, but we've agreed that we'll take questions anywhere along the way. So anybody has any question to any one of us while we're talking, just raise your hand and we'll deal with it at that time and not force you to wait and try to remember what the question was sometime later on. So if you have a question, just as, while we're doing this. Now, I've given you a couple of amusing quotes about this, Peyton Manning's, because, because his, yes? So, are these segments that you refer to Could you all hear the question? Um, I'm not aware of segments of the economy where franchising systemically has not worked. There are, however, clearly examples of types of products or services or types of businesses where franchising would be not likely to be successful. Uh, if you're Tiffany and you have a very high-end consumer 
but a very limited number of those consumers. And those consumers are willing to travel a long distance to go to the Tiffany store to buy. Then there's not much point in franchising because the whole purpose of franchising is to try to reach a large audience which can't be reached otherwise easily. And so a Tiffany's, for example, would not fit in that category. So I'd say that the answer to your question is I'm not aware of where, the, where it's been tried and failed, although some people like Tiffany may have tried it, but that was simply foolish on their part because it doesn't fit the business model. Does that answer your question adequately? Okay. So please continue to raise, raise your hand and ask questions if you'd like because that's a good example of how a subject I wouldn't have otherwise reached, but I'm glad we had a chance to do that. So with those pluses and minuses, most people who've looked at it, and an increasing number, conclude that it does fit their needs. So that's fine as to the franchisor and the franchisee. But what about from the larger perspective of an economy? What does franchising do for an economy or a society that's worth doing? Well, first of all, any economy, it brings a, an injection of entrepreneurship. It increases jobs tremendously. It provides an opportunity for small businesses who wouldn't otherwise be able to survive, to, to actually survive and thrive. It preserves quality in a way that would be very difficult to do otherwise if everybody, if everybody were allowed to do entirely what they wanted. And when you turn to a developing economy, an emerging or developing society, as we've seen around the world in the post-socialist world, franchising has established a foothold in developing economies because it provides something which had been long lost. I spent a lot of time in uh, Central and Eastern Europe after the fall of the wall, and I was struck by the hunger that many of the citizens of those countries had for something which they'd been told by their grandparents about but had no real personal knowledge of, which was entrepreneurship. And uh, I spent a lot of time in most of those countries talking to people and starting up operations over there. Uh, I will say it's, it can be pretty amusing. I did, did one in Russia once and I gave this long, long talk and diagrams and handouts and the like, and they're all nodding and taking notes. And I'm, I used a, a, a pro forma for a hypothetical company and to show how you would do it if you directly owned it, how you would do it if you franchised it, et cetera. And they're all very taken with this. And they afterwards, they all thank me for this. And then one and sidles up, sort of embarrassed, but says, I have to ask you one question. And he said, one of the key figures that you use there, nobody wanted to ask you, but I will tell you, what, is, what does it mean? And I said, I thought maybe this is an obscure term I'd been using. I said, well, he said, what is rent? And I realized they hadn't known anything except government-owned property for all these years. So it was, I might have been from Mars or Venus as far as they were concerned. But in post-socialist societies, as you see in China today, Franchising has taken, has, has taken not just a foothold, but a giant leap. And as you will see in a moment, I mean, China could well be the largest franchise market in the world and not too far away. So all of this would be fine. All of this would be a nice idyllic world in which the only, dictate, in which the only uh, rules of the game are dictated by the parties. Uh, we have not talked about government at all. But at some point, the hand of government arises. In the 1960s in this, in this country, there were very, it was a pretty early stage of franchising anyway, but there were occasional complaints, some quite justified, some unjustified, some hyperbolically promoted by the press. Most of them fell in the category of they promised me something I didn't get. Uh, they brought a celebrity in and said he was gonna come to every one of my store openings and I never saw him again. That sort of, of uh, 
false advertising type of stuff. But there were no laws until the Federal Trade Commission in the early 1970s began to take note of this and held hearings on the subject of this new animal called franchising and produced a trade regulation rule which required a form of disclosure like a mini SEC prospectus to be provided by a franchisor to a prospective franchisee spelled out in detail. Hearings produced 30,000 pages of record of these hearings, and the Federal Trade Commission then sat on it for the next eight years. And during those eight years, a number of states, their, their interest peaked and their attorneys general and governors politically uh, tantalized by the prospects of, of uh, promotion, publicity of this, began to pass their own laws. And the result is, as, as Robert indicated, we have two types of laws. One is called the disclosure type. And let's talk about that a little bit more. The typical provision of those laws is that when I went to Mary Beth to say, would you like to be my franchisee, I am required by law in this country, by the Federal Trade Commission rule, in every state in the country, and the territories to give Mary Beth a disclosure document it became called a uniform franchise offering circular. But basically, it's a disclosure document which has in it some basic factual information. Who am I? Who are the officers and directors? Who owns this company? What's our history? Have we been bankrupt? Have we been sued? Essentially, what she should know as an informed investor about the people that she's investing in or the system she's investing in. The second part of this offering circular is essentially a layman's language version of my franchise agreement with her. In theory, one that she should be able to read. Not a good idea to read it alone without the franchise agreement. But in theory, it tells her what she needs to know and in layman's language. Of course, as lawyers get their hands on it, it becomes less and less layman's language, but that's the theory behind it. The third piece is financial information about the company, audited financial statements of the company, so she will know what the condition of the company in which she is, of which she's buying a franchise. That's a typical disclosure regulatory requirement. As you'll see, a number of states have passed their own, have adopted their own. They're significant. Uh, significantly similar, but not identical. Now let's talk about the other form of regulation, sometimes called relationship laws. There was agitation for this in Congress back in the 1960s, and over the years, it has periodically returned, sometimes on the Senate side, sometimes on the House side, but it has never been adopted. No so-called relationship law covering franchises across the board has ever been adopted in the United States Congress. Uh, the states, however, as you will see, a number of those have adopted those laws. And what are the typical provisions of a relationship law? Probably the single most common one is a termination provision. It says, I cannot terminate the franchisee without good cause. That would be, and you're going to hear a talk on that later today. That's a typical provision. And good cause is typically defined, not always, but typically defined as a violation of an essential and reasonable provision of a franchise agreement. Certainly enough words in there to keep many more lawyers than these busy for the rest of their lives. But that's essentially what is the most common provision. Probably the second most common provision is a slight variation on that, which is a renewal provision. I can't refuse to renew without good cause, usually defined along the same way. Maybe the third most common is one dealing with transfer. I cannot prohibit the franchisee from transferring the franchise to another franchisee without good cause, sometimes defined somewhat differently. But they spread across the board. 
I counted up the number of different provisions which appear as relationship provisions in different state franchise laws, and I stopped counting at 37. That's as far as they go across the board. And they're all the way from the ones I've described to you to ones which are uh, maddeningly vague uh, in terms of treating the franchisee fairly and then waiting for the rest of your life for that to be litigated to some which are sort of bizarre. Uh, is anybody here from Arkansas? Then I may speak freely. Uh, but if you're from Alabama, you need to ask permission for things like that. Arkansas uh, passed a law which says that if you have an advertising contribution required in your franchise agreement, you have to use the advertising contribution for advertising. Now, one would have thought you wouldn't have to pass a state law to say that. But Arkansas, in its wisdom, thought that was important to do. But that, that is, after all, a state which came perilously close not too many years ago of adopting a law which said that in the interest of simplicity, pi would be rounded off at an even three. So it's not too surprising that, that you occasionally see provisions like that. Now, unlike the disclosure laws, which are similar to one another, the relationship laws are not, and there is no way to do these other than on a retail basis, one by one, examining the laws of each of these states. So let's go further and see what we now know about this. We know for, yes. Can you speak up, please? Sure. Well, you're mixing up several things, but let's 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 respond to that. Okay. Um, first of all, uh, the franchisor may or may not care whether or not the franchisee is in default. In some cases, he is absolutely delighted for him to transfer while he's in default because it saves him the effort of going through the legal process of going through a default proceeding to get someone. Instead, he puts somebody else in that's not in default by definition. His real concern is who is the somebody else? Because the franchisor does not want somebody else to step into his shoes in deciding who is going to be his franchisee. After all, when he sold the franchise the first time, he got to select. He didn't, he, nobody requires him to sell to Mr. X, but he chose to franchise to Mr. X. Did all the process of reviewing him and his qualifications, and he did training for him, et cetera. Now, he obviously made a mistake somewhere because this man got in default, but at least these were his decisions. If he can let him turn around and sell to anybody he wants to, that fundamental interest of his in who is carrying his banner into the commercial marketplace has been taken away from him. So that's the reason why franchisors deeply care to whom the franchise is going to be transferred. But assuming the, the, the transferee meets all his qualifications, the truth is, it's probably the best possible result for him. And many franchisors faced with situations like this and with applicants for franchises will say, that's the solution. Let's, Mr. X, who wants to come into the system, we have this one here, buy this one. So in some ways, it's the solution, not the problem. Other questions before we go any further? Okay, so let's take a look at where these so-called disclosure laws are. And what you see is the states which have passed their own version of disclosure laws. That list is alphabetical. It's not chronological. It may have been, but actually it would have started with California either way, which was the first, the first state to pass one, not, and not unexpectedly. The laws are not significantly different, except that many of them, many of them have registration requirements meaning that unlike the Federal Trade Commission trade regulation rule, where you can't register it or file it, and if you hear a franchisor saying, well, I've filed my papers with the FTC, you know you're talking to somebody who is uninformed or a liar, because you can't file anything with the Federal Trade Commission. They will send it back to you saying, we don't do that. 
but most of these states also require registration. Now, the registration is all across the board. In some cases, as in New York, it's the attorney general. In some cases, as in California, it's the corporations commissioner. In some places, it was whoever drew the short straw the day they passed the law, the secretary of agriculture or something like that. So you have to sort these out. But they've gathered together and formed an organization as part of the National Association of Securities Administrators. They formed a franchise part of this, and they're seeking valiantly to make it as uniform as possible. And there is a document called the Uniform Franchise Offering Circular, which at least in theory will satisfy the laws of all these states. Many of them have special rules of their own, and you must therefore add a special rider or amendment for that state, for, the, for that state's own special requirements. But by and large, you will find that they are similar. Speaking of things which are by and large similar, the definition of franchising that I gave you for the FTC purposes is pretty much what you'll see for all of these. The difference is New York, where I gave you three elements, and New York says that if one of those elements, the so-called fee element, is present, then you only have to have one of the other two, not both. Otherwise, across the board, the three elements I described to you are what you will see there. So those are states with disclosure laws. Let's move on to states with relationship laws. As you will see, that's a larger number because it doesn't require a infrastructure. You don't have to have anybody to administer these laws. They're self-executed. You put something on the books and the parties sue each other, although occasionally in rare situations an attorney general will get involved to enforce the relationship parts of a law. Now if you move on and say, well what about putting those together? This shows you laws which have either one type, the other type, or both. And as you will see, it covers substantially more than half the population of the U.S. But it has some interesting exceptions. This would not entirely match an electoral map in terms of what are the biggest states. You won't see Ohio on there at all. However critical that is on election night, Ohio doesn't have it. You won't see Texas on there, even though it's a very, very big state. You won't see Florida on there, Robert State, although there is, I didn't put it on there. There is a something called a franchise law in Florida, but it is so meaningless that I didn't think it would warrant putting on here. It's a, it's a single, it's a simple piece of paper you file to show people that you haven't, you're not running a Ponzi scheme. It's hard to imagine Florida would have a meaningless law. Right. That's right. It was in the, in the best tradition of Florida. Uh, would you agree with my description, though? Yes. Okay. But but if you take a look, you will see that this is uh, an interesting field for lawyers because you have both federal law and state law. You have two types of state laws. In some places, even the definition of franchising is a little bit different for one of those purposes than for the other of those purposes. But nonetheless, there is a core of law which, after all, didn't exist only a relatively short time ago. That's the background of regulation of franchising at the domestic level in the United States. Before we go further, let's pause and take any questions you have upon the regulation as aspects. And I hope the other faculty members will join in the questions too. I don't. Uh, Bill, yes. I wasn't, but I will. <laughs> I mean, just on top of all that. Well, yeah, well, that, but, but the interesting example of that is what it doesn't do. I mean, yes, there are special industry laws. There is a beer distributors law in most states. In, at the federal level, there is an Automobile Dealers Day in Court Act of 1956. Uh, there is a Soft Drink Bottling Act. So there are special industry laws which exist for many, many industries in this country. Yes. But there isn't one for franchising. Uh, and in many cases, you will find that proposals for franchise laws are really only there because somebody's particular industry, somebody's special ox was being gored. And in many cases, that's the reason those laws proposals don't get passed because when you look into it carefully, you find out that it was 
a service station dealer whose uncle was a state legislator or something like that. And therefore, it's a special industry law which had been adopted but had been rejected as, as being applicable for franchising across the board. The last 40 state legislative proposals have been rejected uh, because they seek to overreach, they seek to reach ailments that can't really be identified and the like. But if you're in a particular industry, yes, you better, you, you better learn the special industry laws for that industry. Other questions on regulation, yes? Let me tell you the, the no part and the yes part, and I'm firm on both. Uh, no, there is not a trend for more state laws. In fact, if you take a look at the decade that followed the Federal Trade Commission's first interest in franchising, uh, virtually all the state franchise laws were adopted then. There have been very, very few state franchise laws adopted since that time. There have been repeals of some of those laws. There have been amendments of those laws. There have been rolling back of some of those laws. But there's not a great appetite for new franchise laws enough to get past these last 40, which proposed and were rejected at the state legislative level. Um, now I'll tell you the yes part. If there is going to be more franchise legislation, it's going to be in the area that Robert Emerson is going to be talking about. And that is the relationship between the franchisor and the franchisee and the consuming public. Uh, I, don't want to, I don't want to steal his thunder, but let me just say that the, to, to, to distill it. The issue is the traditional notion that the franchisor and franchisee are separate independent entities and the franchisor can rely upon the world recognizing them being different entities. And therefore, the franchisor is not responsible for acts of omission or commission of his franchisees. He does not have that vicarious liability if he is careful about separating the two companies, that he doesn't have tax law and employment law, et cetera. That's been the, uh, the lodestone of franchising over the years. As you will hear from Robert, there is a development in some cases today which fundamentally challenge the relationship between the franchisor and the franchisee as being separate in terms of what the impact on third parties is. And if those get a foothold, then I could see development of state laws in those areas. I don't otherwise see a development of more franchise laws, and they're enough to deal with now. Yes, sir. Yes. Okay. Um, there is certainly merit to it. I mean, there are clearly areas of law that, that could be regulated more. Uh, I don't think you will find many cases of courts 
upholding terminations for trivial or minor provisions. What I said to you earlier about uh, that in most cases good cause is required and in most cases good cause is defined as violation of an essential and reasonable provision of a franchise agreement. That's if, not what the statutes say. Well, if, the statutes say any violation and, and I, courts enforce that. And, I, and I'm saying that if you go back and read the cases, you will find very few where that's been challenged in which a franchise is well. the cases I've represented the I know, I know. I'm going to I'm going to have to cut this off only yeah. just right. no, but no no let me tell you, only reason I'm uh, only I'm, I'm a little concerned I don't know if it's going to be me out, but if you absolutely want to make sure your comments are are heard you probably want to go to one of the mics we may pick it up and I'm yes, speaking right. with my stage whisper so hopefully this picks this up but if you want to make sure it's recorded otherwise we'll just hear Bill responding and we'll kind of well I, I kind of like that business model uh, the, uh, uh, I'm going to have to cut this off only because we're going to run short of time. We have a lot of time uh, packed, uh, cal factored in later for Q&A, and we'll return to all of this. I promise we will. But I'm going to eat into Robert's time unless we move on. So let me try to pick up a, a little more of this before I turn, them, turn it over to Robert, and then we can deal with a lot of this during the Q&A panel later. So moving on we move to the rest of the world. Why does anybody with this big country we live in need to go beyond the United States? Well, because there's a big world out there, and that big world now consists of many more parts of that world where there's receptivity to Western goods and services, where there's a growing middle class, where there's a growing youth class, where social media and others have, have acquainted people around the world with goods and services they would never have known about otherwise. Uh, the people who are franchising internationally are no longer just the giants, the McDonald's, the KFCs, et cetera, but dipping down to a substantially smaller number of people, some of whom shouldn't be franchising internationally, but many of whom are and do it, are doing it successfully. And the franchisees are now a much more diverse group than they ever were. Some of them are smaller companies, but many of them are very large companies, larger than the franchisors, in some cases cutting across several countries, particularly in the Middle East, where they tend to be people who have uh, interest in several countries, to some degree Central and Eastern Europe in the same way, some in some places, and parts of the government are the franchisees. The vehicles being used are, and, and Robert showed you some on the screen, master franchising, area development, et cetera, as opposed to a single unit. It's pretty hard to be the franchisor of a single unit in some small town in Switzerland, uh, and therefore, in most cases, they're granting large territories. And it's taking place basically everywhere. Is it still an American phenomenon? By and large, yes. That's a, that's a map of the, the top 100 global franchises and between 90 and 95% continue to be based in the US. But it is an increasingly porous world. Uh, for example, I'll give you some classic, iconic American franchise companies. Holiday Inn. Dunkin' Donuts, Baskin Robin, Meineke Muffler, Shakey's Pizza, Motel 6. The only thing those companies have in common is they either are or were all owned by foreigners. You wouldn't know that. They don't put a sign up saying foreign owned, but the fact is it's a very attractive way to get into the American franchise market is by acquiring a franchisor. And that's what Burger King did with a Brazilian company recently, and then so and then and it was bought back, et cetera. But so it's a very porous, borderless world, but America remains 
the home of where most of them are. And the reverse flow is also interesting. We're beginning for the first time to see foreign franchises coming into the US from all directions. In many cases, the foothold is uh, where people from that country have settled. Go to Miami and you will find numerous Latin American franchises which, have, which operate there. And, and Vietnamese and Korean in California and in New Jersey, et cetera, because it's beginning to happen all over. But the regulation of franchising overseas is a much more kaleidoscopic picture. At, in the, at the end of the 1970s, that was the regulation of franchising around the world. The world was, in biblical terms, void and without form. There were no laws and therefore no lawyers involved in international franchising. By the end of the 80s, it was virtually the same, except for the province of Alberta and Canada, it remained a purely American phenomenon. Look at it today. In only the last 25 years, that's what's happened. Hardly a part of the world has not been touched, except for South Africa, there's nothing in Africa to speak of, uh, and uh, very little in the, middle, in the Middle East at all. Otherwise, nothing in Antarctic, uh, but the day is young. Uh, but the rest of the world is virtually, only a few years ago, there was nothing in Asia at all. And yet Asia today is the most regulated part of, part of the world. The kinds of those laws, as you see from those colors, are some disclosure type, some relationship type, some both. But, and I, my paper, which you will, you will not have to read until June, I'm told, when it comes out, uh, I, go, I go in exhaustive and exhausting detail into the laws of those countries and they are candidly a mess. Uh, more attention was given to the Federal Trade Commission's trade regulation rule than to all those non-US laws combined with a multiple of several times. And those laws are frequently adopted without a lot of study, without care, and frankly, in many places, because they said franchising is successful in America, there are franchise laws in America, ergo, we need a franchise law. And it was simply lifted up, adopted, made a few changes with no real knowledge of what it's about. The consequence is that for franchise laws going around the globe, they've got to comply in one form or another with this kaleidoscope of laws, which are not like the US laws well thought out, and there's not a lot of knowledge about how to do it. So the, the question is, where do we, by the way, in my paper, these are not the only laws that franchise always have to deal with. There are parts of all of these disciplines uh, that are needed that, that you have to be aware of as well in dealing with franchising around the world. So in addition to which, um, what we say is franchising and is not franchising is not so easy to tell. As Robert pointed out, the Wadi Band doesn't even use the word franchising. Uh, there are places in the world in which there's essentially a franchise law with no nothing, nothing called that. And even if we say there's no law, such as Germany, by civil law in Germany, the disclosures you give a contracting party are essentially what you would do if there were a franchise law. So don't be quite so sure that you can rely upon that map that I just showed you. So what we, to, to bring it to a conclusion, where I conclude is, is that, the, the, that the laws outside the US are fr frequently vague, frequently inconsistent, clearly mutually inconsistent, and without the sort of infrastructure which lawyers would like to be able to deal with in trying to figure out how to advise their clients. Frequently, are the, they are the product, product of, frankly, social engineering. Uh, throughout Asia, there are laws which say, you can't franchise here until you have, had, at, until you have a store operating here for at least two years. And that's not designed to protect franchisees, although they say it is. It's mostly designed to protect the existing parties. You can't be closer than a certain, uh, certain distance from X, and that's designed to protect X. Uh, you can't have more than a certain number of units in a, in a network. That's not designed to protect franchisees. It's designed to protect existing competitors from companies getting too big and on and on and on. There are just a series of disturbing and disconcerting what I would call social engineering aspects of those laws which are very hard to deal with. Now none of this is because of hostility to franchising. They're not hostile to franchising. The pro-franchising statements that are made by government officials all over the world are pretty astonishing 
and in my paper I set out financial schemes, one after another, which are set up to provide financing for and to provide training to make franchising work in their country. There are some countries themselves which are actively promoting their own franchising around the world. They're simply, I think, misinformed in terms of what's needed to make it work. And it can be profoundly disruptive to the plans of multinational franchisors. So the question is, what do you do about it? Now, let me tick off some, some straw men. Uh, uniformity, it would be nice to do that, won't work. I've spent a lot of my life involved in endless conferences in crumbling villas in Rome and places in Brussels and Paris where people got together and tried to have uniform laws. And they simply won't work. There's simply too much nationalism and too many people have too much um, psychic, psychic investment in what they've done to repeal any of those laws. That's not going to happen. Testing the waters. And we have some of that in America. New York, for example, permits you to sell up to two franchises if that's all you're going to do in a state without having to go through the full range of the, of the regulation, an effort to find out whether it's really going to work. Most places around the world, you can't do that. So testing the waters won't work because it costs you just as much to sell the first franchise as to sell the first 100 or 1,000 franchises. Protecting only those who need protection, a very useful approach, now being adopted in many, country, many states, saying if it's an investment over a certain amount of money or if the, if the investor, the franchisee, is a sophisticated but measured similar approach to the accredited investor approach to securities laws, then you're exempt from a part or all of that regulation, aiming at the people who do need protection. You find virtually none of that outside America and some in Canada. So I go back to the fact that a, a, an organization called UNIDWA, uh, which tried valiantly for a number of years to produce a model franchise law, ultimately realized it couldn't really do that, but nonetheless produced an invaluable study and reaches the following conclusion. So I would say the genie is out of the bottle as far as existing laws go. But as far as the rest of the world, and particularly with that map, there's still a lot of that world which is not covered. I think that there is still an opportunity to tell people that when they approach franchising, they should go back to these first principles, which was set out in the UNIDRA document which is what the legislators ought to ask is, is there a problem, what is the nature of it, and what action, if any, is necessary? Is it something which is limited to a particular industry or not? It, can you be satisfied that prospective investors will be more likely to protect themselves if they get this information? Are the economic and social interests of the country best served by this? Is there a pattern of abusive conduct? Or, as I say, is it limited to a particular industry? What's the nature of the evidence? Some of these have not even looked to see whether there is it. Whether existing laws address the concerns. In some cases, they do. Is there any effective form of self-regulation? In, in England, they think there is. They think the British Franchise Association's code of self-regulation is adequate. Is the financial burden, and there is one, make no mistake, that it places upon people, is it worth it compared to the benefits of what you get out of it? And whether it ultimately, from a public policy point of view, inhibits or facilitates entry by franchisors and the effect on job creation and investment. I think it's the responsibility of the international legal community to try to spread that message. We have done a terrible, terrible job of it so far. We, I don't think, can re think we can make the world a better place to do business, but maybe we can stop it from being a worse place to do business. I'm going to stop at that point, turn it over to Robert, but there's going to be ample time for questions and answers later. Thank you very much for your patience.